My name is Bryce Conway, and I have not paid for a flight in about five years. Uh, we're going to talk about how exactly I do that here in a second. Uh, but first, I want to start out with a, a bit of a story that's going to tell you a lot about who I am as a person, and more importantly, how I really got into this field. So let me set the stage for you here. I'm from Ohio, which, for those of you who are not from the States, is a lot like Inverness. It's, it's very cold there. There's not a lot of, of population and, uh, and people who live there. And I went to university there, and it was January of 2011. And I'm sitting there in my house, and, and it looks like this outside. It's freezing cold, so cold that you don't even want to go outside. And I'm sitting around with my roommates, and we're talking about what are our plans going to be for spring break. Now, for those of you not familiar, spring break in the United States is uh, it's a, it's a week off of classes for students in university where they typically go down to a warm beach, and you drink and you have fun with the thousands of other people that are thinking just like you, just looking to kick back and relax. Now, there was one big problem. Ohio does not look like this. You really can't drive to a place like this from Ohio. And I was completely broke as a college student, so the question is, how could I go from cold and snowy and nasty and go down and hang out with my friends on the beach? So, um, you know, the quote that was going in my mind, necessity is the mother of invention. So, I'm really determined to get from the cold and snow down to the beach to hang out with my friends. So I literally pull up my computer and I Google how to travel for cheap. Now in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking of these things that you hear about where, uh, you know, hey, if you carry this special late package, we're going to pay for part of your flight. Or, you know, do a day of uh, some sort of mission work or, or take pictures and we'll subsidize your flight. Well, turns out those types of things really don't exist that you hear about. So I did all kinds of searching. How do I fly for cheap? How do I travel for cheap? Like, I'll climb into the wheels of the plane, just get me down to spring break. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned, that, there's really no options like that. So frustrated, I remember closing my browser, walking downstairs and sitting with my friends, being like, that's it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call my parents and say, hey, get my childhood room ready. I'm actually going to be coming home for spring break. Yay. So I continue on with my you know, day-to-day -day life in college. And as many of you who use the internet know, Google tracks everything that you, you search. And I noticed that from that point forward, every time I'd open up my internet browser, there's, there's all these ads for airline credit cards. Like, hey, apply for this card and we'll give you 50,000 points. Like, I don't even know what that is. Or this card's gonna give you a couple of free flights if when you apply. It's like, you know what? I'm a college student, I'm 21 years old, I really wanna get to the beach. Um, let's just give this a try and see if it works. So I remember clicking, quickly filling out an application, uh, I have less than $5,000 of annual income at the time. Somehow, I'm approved for a $10,000 credit card. Hmm, okay. So I'm supposed to get two free flights out of this. So, you know, I'm pretty skeptical, but like I said, pretty desperate. So I jumped through the couple of hoops that you have to do to earn those, and lo and behold, I actually earned enough points for a couple of free flights. So I'm looking at flights from Ohio to Florida, and I'm like, wait a second, I earned two free flights. Like, let's, let's take this to the next level. So not only did I book a flight to Florida for spring break for about $6 in taxes, I had enough to then fly from Florida to Las Vegas for the second half of spring break, and then from Las Vegas home. So I had the time of my life that week, you know, like, wow, I went from like, I'm gonna hang out with my parents this spring break to I was in Florida and Las Vegas. Uh, you know, my friends were like, did Bryce start dealing drugs? Like, where did the money come from? Uh, how did you afford that? So I'm telling them what I did. Um, but I get home from my trip, and I remember again sitting in my house and thinking, okay, like someone's going to say something, the phone's going to ring, the cops are going to show up, I'm going to get a letter saying, like, you're in big trouble for doing that. So uh, I wait a couple days and nothing happens. And, and then actually I go in and I check my credit score, which again, my big concern, this is going to wreck my credit. And uh, my credit score actually went up. And I was like, whoa, like, why would I not just do this again? So I did. And I was like, right, let's just apply for another credit card. And I, I quickly realized that this is a, a, a field, it's called travel hacking, we'll get to that in a second. But it's an entirely arbitrage opportunity which you can take advantage of things like this to travel. So let's talk about that. There are three things that I want to cover in today's presentation. Number one is that it is entirely possible to travel the world for next to nothing simply by beating banks and credit card companies at the very game that they created. And number two, the methods that we use are, are not incredibly difficult. In fact, I'm going to cover some of the basic ones here today. Hopefully, you'll leave this, this TED Talk having a basic idea of, of how this works. Uh, and lastly, and, and probably most importantly, is that traveling is one of the most important things you can do to develop as a person. And, and travel hacking is what has really given me the opportunity to do that. So before we talk about how you can beat the banks and credit cards at their own game, let's talk about what exactly is that game. And to do that, we're going to dive into a little bit of economics and statistics here, so stay with me. So talking about American households, 
Credit cards are a pretty major financial problem in America, at least for consumers. 46% of American households have some sort of credit card debt. And of those 46%, the average is $15,863, which is, is mind-boggling when you think about that. About half of American households have that. And the average rate of interest they're paying on that is 15%. So you don't have to be a, you know, a, a math whiz, although we do have one here in the house. Um, to say that the, that the average American is paying thousands of dollars a year to banks and credit card companies just because they are misusing those products. So from the credit card uh, standpoint, that's a huge profit. Uh, looking quickly at historical credit card uh, debt statistics in America, um, as you can see, debt, credit, or average credit card debt per household really peaked right before the crisis in 2008, 2009, up to 19,000, and that's probably more of a, a natural resting place that you're going to see. Um, it plummeted here, but that was not actually a positive thing. That was entirely due to write-offs when, you know, the economy collapsed, jobs dried up. Uh, most people were defaulting on their credit card debts. They were actually being written off. So it wasn't that we were using less credit cards in America. It's just that it was becoming a problem. But it's actually slowly starting to rise, and, and all predictions say it's going to go even higher. So this is, this is not going to change. Uh, this is something you're going to see for years to come, um, entirely because of, of the misuse of credit cards. And then looking at the other side of the coin here, the, the folks who issue those cards, the banks and, and the credit card companies, you know, where is their money coming from? Well, the largest uh, percentage of that, about 34%, is from interchange fees. You know, they make a small percentage. Even when you buy, uh, you know, you go out to the bar here and you buy a whiskey, a uh, credit card company is going to make about 2% on that. But if you add up the other parts, both interest income and cardholder fees, you'll see that banks and credit card companies are actually making about two-thirds of their money entirely off of consumers who are spending too much and, and really can't keep up and end up paying a bunch of interest and fees. So if you were running a business like that, that wasn't that incredibly profitable, what would you do? Well, you'd, uh, well, as I mentioned, credit card companies making a ton of money off of interest. Um, but what would you do if you're running one of those businesses? Well, you would be marketing like crazy because potentially every person that you put a credit card into their hands is, is huge profit for you when they inevitably are going to misuse that. So they have these things called sign-up bonuses. Uh, you know, you really can't even go to a, a retail store in the United States anymore and, and check out and not be like, hey, do you want to save 15% by signing up for our credit card? You know, they're really quick to put these in your hands. And, and these are just some examples that I've come across. Uh, you know, Walmart, particularly generous, will give you a two liter of soda if you sign up for their credit card. You know, <laughs> forget travel hacking, I'll think about going to soda hacking, really the next big thing. Um, but what you'll find is uh, they, they use some marketing that is, is questionably, uh, you know, aggressive. Things like, you know, you can now own anything, anytime, anywhere. Like, you know, what kind of message is that sending? But again, think about what they're doing from a business standpoint. They're trying to push this in your hands because they know that they're going to make a lot of money on that. So, it's a trap. <laughs> As Admiral Lockbar says, it's entirely a trap. They, they know that they're going to make money on you. They're pushing these into your, into your hands. And they're really hanging these bonuses out there as like a bait. Uh, most people don't even know if the points are going to get them. Like, yeah, 80,000 points, sure, sign me up. Uh, so, it, it's entirely a trap but it's one that can be beaten uh, with a, a process called travel hacking. Now, I want to say also that I'm not a big fan of the name. I'd like to find the guy that said travel hacking. Like, what are you thinking? You're scaring people off. Uh, plus, I could sound a lot more intelligent at TED Talk if I'm saying, hey, that's um, arbitrage opportunities offered by short-term debt products in the United States. Hey, that sounds great. <laughs> but no, they call it travel hacking, so that's, that's what we're going with. So this is a way to beat the banks at their, at their own game. Now, there are three basic uh, rules to travel hacking. Number one, you want to earn as many points and miles as is humanly possible. Um, these are things like frequent flyer miles, hotel points. You know, to the average person that isn't traveling all the time for work, like, ah, oh, that doesn't really have any worth. Yeah, when you have about two million of them, they really do. Um, you want to redeem those points and miles for as much travel as you possibly can. It goes without saying. But most importantly, number three, you want to accomplish goals one and two without falling into that trap that we talked about. You can't let yourself go into debt. You can't start spending a bunch more money you're going to quickly wipe out your gains. So let's talk first about earning as many miles as you can, and we're going to go back to the sign-up bonuses. Now, beyond the offering a two-liter to sign up uh, at Walmart, there are actually some, some very good sign-up bonuses out there that are offered mainly by airline credit cards, usually 50,000 points about. And for some quick background, in, in the industry, we say about a benchmark is one cent per point. So you see 50,000 points. I see $500 of travel when I look at that. $400 of travel, 750 a particularly good one. Um, these are all over the place. So Google search airline credit card sign-up bonus. You're going to find literally dozens of these things just out there waiting to be had. Now, the typical person, again, goes after this, falls into the trap, pays debt. But what if you were to, you know, like I did with my spring break trip, you apply for one of these cards, you get all those miles, you spend them. You don't go into debt. You apply for another card, you get all these miles, you spend them. 
don't go to debt. And you keep on repeating that process over and over. That's arbitrage. Uh, I do about 20 to 25 of these credit cards a year. And people look at you like you're crazy, but if you think about it, I mean, $500 that you're being given up front, multiply that times 20, that is a lot of free travel. It's what allows me to, up on a whim, come to Inverness and, and talk to you guys about this. So you can earn more than 1 million frequent flyer miles a year without ever stepping into a plane entirely by taking advantage of these arbitrage opportunities. Next, in a key component, or next key component of travel hacking is something called manufactured spending. Now this is one that most people haven't heard of until I, I reference this specific uh, situation. Uh, the United States government had a brilliant idea in the late 2000s, hey, we want to cut down our currency costs, paper bills are, are too expensive to keep making, so we're going to launch a $1 coins and we're going to sell them on the internet. And because no one would buy currency for more than it's worth, we're going to do it at an exact one-to-one -one ratio, we're not going to charge shipping, and oh, we're going to accept credit cards. You know, to the average person, like, oh, that's kind of cool. To me, I'm like, yes. So it was, it was incredibly easy, just go online, you buy $10,000 of these coins, put it on your credit card, you know, you're earning 10,000 reward points. You could just take those right to the bank, deposit them, pay off your very credit card. Arbitrage. So we were doing that. I mean, people were ordering thousands of these, but this guy took it to a whole new level. Four million over the course of four years. Uh, you know, again, one cent a piece, that's $40,000 of travel at least in, in a pure arbitrage situation. So, and then of course what the government found is that the only people who are going to buy dollar coins online are people like me. They're just going straight back into the banks and it didn't work and they eventually shut that down. But it proves the point of something called manufactured spending. That that's one of very many opportunities you have to buy cash equivalents with a credit card and just turn around and pay off your very credit card. You're moving money through like crazy. So, you know, the typical person might spend two to $3,000 a month on their credit card if we're talking about medium incomes in the United States. I'm currently doing about 50,000 a month. That's all coming straight back out to me. So you're just printing money. It is purely arbitrage from a travel standpoint and one that's important to travel hacking. And another reason why manufacturing spending is, is so powerful is because what the credit card companies have done is they're like, all right, we have these big new bonuses, you know, $500 of travel, but you have to spend $5,000 before we're gonna give that to you. Easy, I can hop online and buy $5,000 of US coins, take them straight to the bank, and then literally one day I've made $500 of free travel. So, pretty easy. Number two, you wanna redeem those points and miles for as much travel as possible. Now, I, I'm not gonna be able to get into all the details of that. Uh, this is where it gets pretty complex, but experience will be your, your guide. But I will show you that the most recent trip that I took with my wife, um, we were able to find some pretty awesome opportunities with these points and miles. So much so that we went to Thailand, and because I like to you know, kind of do things up big, uh, calculated out the cost of what we would have paid in travel. It was about $28,000 uh, with a business class. Um, bottom left, you'll see me sitting there in a, a Boeing 787 Dreamliner. It's about a $10,000 ticket. I paid $72.80 for it uh, in taxes and fees. So we stayed in some of the best hotels. We had enough money to ride on elephants and have the time of our lives, and we spent about you know, $326.42 out of pocket, entirely on taxes and fees, and entirely because of this opportunity called Travel Hack. Lastly, and most importantly, you have to accomplish goals one and two without falling into the trap. Again, they're, they're baiting you with these points, and they're saying, we think you're gonna go into debt and pay fees. I think absolutely not. So there's, there's three uh, tips that you have to have there. Number one, a zero dollar increase in organic spending. So the temptation is, and in, in getting into psychology, hey, I have this new car, and I'm earning points, I really wanna go to Thailand. You know, I, you know, actually, I really do need a new jacket. I think I'm gonna go buy that $500 jacket and earn some points to Thailand. That is the, the trap right there. So you have to be very careful to monitor your spending levels. Don't let that get out of control. Number two, no negative impact to your credit score. Now, the common misconception about uh, travel hacking and applying for all these cards is that you, know, you have 20 credit cards, that's gonna destroy your credit score. Uh, it's actually not the case, and in fact, it's the entire opposite. Uh, you'll see your credit score go up much, much higher because you're just stuffing your credit report with so much positive data uh, to, to carry it up. It's, the analogy I make is it's much like going to university and, and just taking five easy classes every single semester in addition to your hard ones. It's gonna prop up your GPA like crazy. Of course, if you're making all your payments on time and, and not breaking rule number one. And then lastly, only paying fees that make sense. Uh, a lot of these credit cards will charge you an annual fee, $95 up to $500. They'll give you some sort of perks for that or bonus miles. You wanna avoid those whenever possible unless it really fits in line with what you're trying to do. So why? Why do all this? Why travel? Uh, why earn all these points? Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, before I kind of jump into that, I'm going to cover what we call the uh, perception of knowledge curve. I'm sure that some of you have experienced this personally. Here in this graph here, you see that you have, uh, you know, how much you think that you know about a subject once start getting started. 
uh, how much more you realize that there is to know and how much you actually know. And what you have here is kind of the, the sophomoric problem where once you just start into some sort of new field, it's like, hey, I instantly think that I'm an expert. Uh, and then it kind of tapers off as you realize I really don't know a lot that there is out there. The same is true of travel and really of the world. Um, you know, travel makes one modest. Uh, you see what a tiny place you occupy in the world. And the more that you do that, the more that this rings true and the more that you're really going to internalize that as a human being. Uh, great story is when I was in Thailand, this is Tom. Uh, he was uh, our guide for the day in, in North Thailand. And while I was at university and, and trying to get off to spring break and, and learning about all these travel points, uh, Tom was actually a monk in, in North Thailand for eight years. Uh, he lived in a cave and really had no access to the outside world. He spent uh, hours a day meditating and we actually went for weeks without even speaking. So I learned more in spending one afternoon with Tom exploring his hometown than I did in years of studies about you know, what it means to be human and to be humble as you travel the world. It's opportunities like that that travel hacking will give you and that are so vital. Tom actually took us to pay alms to some of the monks that are, are still in his church today. And these guys walk miles a day carrying their big buckets around their neck just to collect some food for themselves and to share with the orphanages in the area. And again, you can read about that all day. You can, you can search that online and, and feel like you're learning something, but until you really get out there and experience things like this, it's, uh, it's, it's a whole different ballgame. Number two, Mohammed once said, don't tell me how educated you are, tell me how traveled you are. That is, again, going to that earlier point of there is no substitute for what you can learn by getting out there. You know, my wife and I have been privileged to spend the last basically five years traveling wherever and whenever we want, thanks to this wonderful opportunity of travel hacking. Uh, we, you know, we've seen basically every single state in the United States. We've, we've gone abroad multiple times, Asia and Europe. And the opportunities that we've had out there to learn have been so, so far beyond what we've experienced just in your day-to-day -day life. And, and travel can offer you that, and it's really vital to give that a try. Another thing that you'll find with Americans is we have this kind of ethnocentrism. Uh, we think that America is the greatest country on earth. Uh, and I, I think the same could be said about a lot of countries. But the more that you travel, the more that your fear of, of the unknown and of other cultures completely dissipates. And you actually get to learn so much from interacting with other people and other ideas. This is my wife in Amsterdam. You know, if you were in the United States and you set up a sign that said free hugs and you're hugging people, they'd think, oh, you're going to stab me with a needle and give me HIV, you know, rob me. This was just a, an eye-opening experience there in Amsterdam. Just free hugs. Like, they want to just be friendly to people that are coming through. And, and it's, it's opportunities like those that really help you to learn what it means to be a human being. My favorite quote about travel by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the mind, once stretched by a new idea, will never return to its original dimensions. And I think the same is exactly true of the world. Uh, before you get out there and get to experience it, you're really thinking, you know, I, I feel like I understand the world. I've read about it. I've watched the news. Um, but as you travel, your view of the world will expand and, and never, ever be the same. You know, coming here to Scotland, already learning so much here, it's, it's, my world expanded just a little bit more. And, and that is just so vital to becoming, you know, the best human being that you can be. And um, travel hacking can offer you that opportunity. So I urge you, just take a look at this, give it a chance, and I promise that you'll never look back. Thank you.